So I noticed, Warwick, outside the studio, some new wheels today. Uh, there might be. Yeah, someone got a new toy, didn't they, on the weekend? I. It's not a toy. It's a commuting machine. Okay, so for people that care, tell them what you got. <laughs> I bought a motorcycle. Yeah, what It's a kind? Triumph Speedmaster. It's a beautiful British twin. It's got loud pipes on it. Okay, and, enough, yeah. Okay. So did you buy it because you thought you could pick up more chicks with it? I did have that consideration <laughs> as I rode away from the dealership. It's <laughs> like, man, I must look so cool. <laughs> Any luck yet? Uh, no, you want to go for a ride? <laughs> no. Welcome to the Trading's Business Show, helping you get off the tools and into true business ownership so you can spend more time doing the things that matter most. Now, here are your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. And welcome to another episode of the Tradies Motorcycle Show. Um, uh, I mean, business motor- show. I should do a motorcycling podcast. I bet there's a thousand of them. Yeah, I, you know what? I'm, I'm going to start a, I don't know, discrimination something or other because I have to move my car every three hours and you've just told me you'll never <laughs> have to jealous. move your car again. Because there's motorcycle parking well, there's and there's motorcycle- no time limit. Yeah, there's no limit on the motorcycle yeah, parking. because they take, like, there's five motorcycles out there that take up the <laughs> space of your car. Still not fair. Yeah, and I rode up the inside lane this morning. <gasps> there was a big accident on the highway. It's like, see you, suckers. <laughs> G'day to all the car drivers out there. Good to have you on the show. Uh, and welcome again. to Warwick's Midlife Crisis. Yes, my second one. Um, <laughs> so, cool guest today. All our guests are cool. What am I saying? But um, I, I like today's. There was some great, and I think some timely... Uh, topics and discussions uh, with today's guest that a lot of our members in the Tradies Toolkit have actually been um, talking about some of these topics of late. So good to hear uh, some uh, confirmation, I guess, on some of these things from Selena Scoble, who yeah. uh, is a former Olympian. And if you want to know what res- resilience is like, imagine, yeah. you know, the day before you're about to play in the Olympics, you get injured. And, and the tell doctors me you, say you cannot play tomorrow or, you know, you can't play this Olympics. The day before the opening and, ceremony. And your whole sporting career has led to the that. Exact moment. I, I didn't ask Lena this question, but I wanted to say, how many litres of tears did you cry <laughs> that night? <laughs> did you ever want to be in an Olympic sport? What would it be if you were an Olympian? Just uh, side point. Uh, cycling? No. Um, no, no, side point. Oh, right, right. Off, off I, topic. um... I actually wanted to be a boxer. Oh. Yeah. Huh. But my arms are too short, so I'd get my head caved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually really liked boxing for some reason. I don't know why. I never did it. Yeah. Um, I was too short for basketball, though I enjoyed that. Yeah, so, you got a bit short for basketball. <laughs> yeah. They'd never say never, but they, anyway. They don't have an Olympics for accounting or talking, so I'm kind of stuffed there. Yeah. What about you? Um, oh, look, I wouldn't be picky. Any sport that I get to go to the Olympics in, I'd <laughs> yeah, probably... Just be to go whatever's the least something. effort. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Lawn bowls? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's darts. probably not... No, yeah, no, darts, no. darts. Is darts at the Olympics? No, no. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I think lawn bowls probably would be... The shooting sports are good. Some of the target shooting, because you get to lie down. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, you just shoot all day. <laughs> I don't Just like exercise your, your trigger finger. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so, no, some really good big takeaways from this one. We always say that, but there is some... Uh, really big ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, enjoy today's interview. So joining us, uh, well, live in the studio, but remotely, um, <laughs> even though we're both in the same city, this is the, the wonders of modern technology, uh, joining us today is Selena Scoble. So welcome to the Tradies Business Show, Selena. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Our, Hello, everyone that's listening. Our pleasure. Uh, so for the benefit of our listeners, in case they don't know who you are, uh, <laughs> can you tell us uh, a bit about your journey so far, Selena? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess to make it short and sweet, not to bore too many people, but uh, past life was an Olympian. Um, I was very heavily involved in basketball and volleyball throughout my teenage years. Um, fortunate to go to play in America on a dual scholarship for both sports at Division One College called Oregon State University and then went on to play in the 2000 Olympics in indoor volleyball. Um, so that was obviously a huge pinnacle in my life and I'll share a bit more about what happened during that time um I almost didn't get to play so um yeah and then post-olympics I uh became a a business coach 
and uh, moved into the online world after a couple of years, um, seeing the future of online. And um, that's where I've been the last eight or so years, um, doing lots of different things, trying lots of different things, learning lots of different things. And as we all know, it changes rapidly, technology. Um, I co-founded um, a company that ended up running the world's largest online event for the fitness industry um, and recently sold it out of that to get into my passion in, in the sports world and combine online with sports. So that's what I'm heavily involved with now. Yeah, cool. So uh, <laughs> you've got a fair variety there, Selena. <laughs> Do you get bored <laughs> easily? Is that, is that what's going on there? Uh, I just grab opportunities and, yeah, I definitely don't get bored. <laughs> just say, say yes to stuff. Yep. Cool. Give I like things that a go. Approach. Give I things like a crack. Approach. So, Selena, you um, obviously talked about your sporting background and, and I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of your identity, I suspect. Would that be, be a fair observation? Yeah, obviously it was. <laughs> Um, and it was that's, I guess, one of the hardest things, I think, for elite athletes is when they do eventually retire due to choice or injury. Or um, it, is a, it is a tough transition because, like I said, it is your identity for so many years. Mm. It usually starts back as a kid. Um, and then to figure out, well, what do I want to do next? And um, it, it is. It is a big, big, big identity thing of switching over or, you know, adding – to what you've been doing and, and figuring out what you want to do next. Yeah, I find it really interesting. I've always wanted to get inside the, the head of an elite athlete because the focus and dedication that must go into it. Look, I had a goal of getting to the opening ceremony of the Olympics, certainly not <laughs> participating when I was a child. Uh, but it must be just the focus and commitment needed to, to go for that many years, you know, to that level. Uh, it must be an, an interesting journey, the whole uh, head games that you must play. Oh, most definitely. I think that's what, um, you know, defines the difference between people who don't get there and do get there. A lot of it's going to come down to the mindset. Um, and because, you know, with everything, with sport, with business, with life, it's not easy. You go through ups and downs, and I guess it's how you choose to respond. Um, that's the difference. There's a great quote um, Charles Swinball, I think his name is, um, who says, you know, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% on how you respond. So I've always um, really liked that quote because, yeah, it definitely comes down to how we choose in the moment to respond to every, every daily event that happens to us from the time the alarm clock goes off to what we choose to eat for breakfast to things that happen throughout the day and so on and so forth. So, um to even major events, which, you know, I'll get into a bit later, but, yeah, lost my house and everything in it in the 2011 floods, and that was a very good test of, um, you know, resilience. So um, it happens. We all, we all know about it. We all go through tough days, and I guess that's the key is how we respond back and how we get refocused on our vision and our goals to, to keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So you've mentioned a couple of uh, significant events in your career and your life selena can you uh expand on those a little bit and i suppose you know, how's that actually helped you perhaps in business or i mean life in general yeah i guess probably the the first one the biggest one that i had in my sporting career um was at the olympics and um it was actually the day before the opening ceremony it was our very last training session um, i actually played a middle blocker so i played indoor volleyball so the six on the team, I played at the middle of the net, middle blocker, middle hitter. And we were doing a blocking drill and I went out to block with my outside blocker and we both went up and as I came down, I landed on their foot and went over and sprained my ankle. I actually had an ankle brace on, but the plastic in it snapped in half. Um, rushed back to the village, had x-rays, saw the doctors and they said, you know, sorry with the damage you've done, you're not playing at the Olympics. So this was literally the day before the opening ceremony. So <laughs> you can imagine it's like every athlete's nightmare to, you know, have all that sacrifice and hard work and to finally get to the Olympics and, and to have something like that happen. It was absolutely crushing. And 
So um, at that moment you know, when they said, sorry, buddy, I just want to get that moment where they said, sorry, you're not going to play, what, what went through your mind at that moment? It was a real surreal moment. It's one of those, you know, just time stopped and you're just like, no, this – I mean, when I sprained my ankle, I knew it wasn't good. I mean, I felt the pain and everything. I was just like, oh, no, I just – you know, am I going to be able to pull through for this? Luckily, we had – there was our schedule because every athlete, every sport's a bit different, but we played every second day. So we had five games all up, so we were over 10 days. Um, so yeah, it was just such the unknown and just, you know, you just, you go through the emotion, you're just upset, pissed off. And then it gets to a point where you're like, okay, what can I do to just try and make sure I do my best that I can to give it every chance that I can play. And I guess that's why I was so fortunate being at the Olympic village. You've got the best of the best around you. You've got the best doctors, best physios. So um, in the best support. So I was very fortunate, actually. I had um, Peter Brock, the late guru Peter Brock, who sadly passed away now. But um, he at the time was one of our liaisons for the Australian Olympic team. And he came into the physio room and uh, sat with me and shared uh, one of, a very personal and powerful story from his racing career. And he said, look, I know those doctors have told you that you can't play but you can get back out there and get on that court and play. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, this guy's a legend in obviously the car racing industry. And I was just like, I'm, I'm going to listen to every word he's going to say, you know. And he said, look, I had a very similar experience a week before I had to race. And he said, I cut my hand on a barbed wire fence out at my farm. And he said, I cut it so bad that it needed stitches. I went to the doctor and they said, no, mate, you're not racing next week. You've cut your hand that bad. You need stitches. You're not, you're not racing. And he said, nah, I'm not getting stitches. I'm going to race next weekend. A bit of a, a, bit of a stubborn man on Brocky. <laughs> yep. And um, he said he went home and for that next week he visualized little soldiers marching down his arm and he visualized the soldiers sewing up his hand with a needle and thread and he visualised the fibres mending back together again. And he said he always, always, before every race, he would always visualise himself in the car going through the track, going through the race. He knew every corner. He felt himself changing gears. He would smell his helmet. He would feel the sweat dripping to the point where he, physiologically, he would actually have sweat dripping um, there's a powerful exercise I do in seminars with that with lemon um, where you you know can think about something and physiologically your body has responses and changes. Um, so the mind is extremely, extremely powerful. And anyway, Brocky said he always used to always see himself go over that finish line first. And so, you know, at first I was like, whoa, visualising little soldiers <laughs> marching down my leg to sew my ankle. Is this a bit out there, like I know Peter Brock was a bit out there with some things. He went alternate there for a while, but I'm <laughs> like, oh, this is Peter Brock, man. I've got to listen to this guy, yeah. and he's um he's a legend. So, you know, I started. We used to always do it in sport anyway, then the power of visualization. But he took it to another level with not seeing in your mind's eye what you want to happen, actually engaging all five senses, and I guess that was the real key to his visualisation was that you've got to see it, you've got to smell it, you've got to hear it, you've got to taste it, you've got to engage all your senses. You've got to, because the subconscious brain doesn't know the difference between reality and non-reality. So if you can program that before it's actually happened, when you actually go to do it, it's like you've already done it so your body knows what to do. Mm. So it's just an extremely powerful tool. So that's kind of where it started for me in terms of, um, I guess, really learning this another level of how the mind works in terms of not just visualising and seeing stuff but um, actually feeling and smelling, engaging all the senses during the visualisation and knowing too that when you start to play that scenario in your head, you've got to see it perfectly exactly how you want it to be, play out because human nature we just we have these fears jump in and we see ourselves stuff up or make mistakes and 
see bad things happen. So if you start to visualize and you see something bad happen or feel something bad happen, you've got to stop that video playing in your head and go back to the beginning again. You've got to have the confidence and see it perfectly um, to our will to, I guess, manifest or, or create that on a subconscious level. Otherwise, you're just programming yourself for failure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, a really, really powerful tool from Peter Brock. Um, so I ended up visualizing I was in a wheelchair for the opening ceremony. Some people may remember the wheelchair. Um, and I was visualizing my soldiers and running down my leg and visualizing the fibers mending back together. And uh, I ended up playing four out of five games at the Olympics. So, wow. I, um, yeah, oh, yeah, a big pinnacle, big pinnacle in my life. And that's the 2000 Olympics here in Australia, wasn't 2000, it? 2000, yep, yeah, Sydney. Sydney. Yep. Yep. Wow. Sydney. How, mm-hmm. how do you rate that experience, Selena? I know you've been asked that question probably a million times so far in your life, but. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously it's a dream come true for any athlete. It's um, the pinnacle. It goes so fast. Like, I wish I could go back and soak up it more, but you're just so, it's such an emotional lead up. We actually, our team didn't get selected until about three months prior to the Olympics. So it was a, it was a really emotional roller coaster leading up to even making the team. And then obviously getting to the Olympics, um, all the stuff that went on. And yeah, it's just, obviously, it's just a huge, it, it's funny, it didn't really hit me. Like at the Olympics, you're like, okay, well, I made it and this is amazing. And you, the opening ceremony was most definitely the biggest highlight, walking out into that stadium with the roar of the crowd and just unbelievable. Um, I was actually... <laughs> Ironically, being in a wheelchair, I got the best seat in the house, so <laughs> I um, was you didn't right get tired. at the front. <laughs> yeah. so see, I that's why see you sprained your ankle. Yeah, you know, there's exactly. always you, you know yeah. gratitude and whatever happens. The universe has a plan. Totally, <laughs> to- I totally believe that. that that's another yeah, <laughs> another subject. But yeah, I, it was it was the best seat in the house. I got to be right at the front stage and see everything, and John Farnham and all that come walking past. And yeah, you definitely it's just. It really didn't hit me probably till the next Olympics when it was, you know, that was over, um, you know, I I went on to finish my degree off in the States and, you know, and then the next Olympics came along and just watching it on TV, I just couldn't stop crying. It was like it really made me realise how massive that achievement was and how proud and, um, you know, to represent your country at that level. You just, it's a once in a lifetime that is just unreplaceable and yeah definitely a um the biggest highlight of my life to date so and so we'll get back i want to ask you some questions about that whole visualization thing but a very important question Mm -hmm. while we're on the olympics so is there really all this antics goes on in the athletes village like give us the (laughs) give us the goss is it as bad as they say or as much fun as they say yeah what happens on tour stays on tour no (laughs) (laughs) even even like you know no yeah i mean everyone's a bit different like i said because it depends on where um like we went for 10 days so we actually didn't finish till right towards the end um whereas some people finish on day one and they've got the rest of a couple of weeks (laughs) to enjoy themselves so um yeah, we were so young back then too. Gosh, we were in our teenage years, early 20s. Um, yeah, it was, it was a great time. We definitely all had a great time. It was, um, you know, just the world coming together and mm. we were staying in the village. So that was a great experience. Just, you know, it was like a little suburb. Um, so you got a lot of perks and um you know, getting free whatever. You went into the into the cafeteria where you eat, and it's the size of two football fields. You've got every cuisine, including McDonald's. No, no um, way. That you Isn't just it, go and help yourself. That's but, Whatever. <laughs> Isn't that funny, though? The highlight of the Olympics is free McDonald's, like for the athletes. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, what the perks are. Because they're so strict for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. eat what you like. So, Selena, how do you return? And, and you know, it's, it's a little while ago now, but... Mm. How, how did you go about returning to quote unquote normal life? It, is does life just not be normal at all after that? Yeah, it was tough. Like I actually straight after the Olympics, I had a few months off, but I had another goal and my and focus was to go back to America because I was on my scholarship over there. Um, I was halfway through my business degree, so I actually had a focus to go back and get my piece of paper and make sure I finished. 
um, my degree off. So for me, that was, you know, I just knew I had to go do that straight after the Olympics. So it was quite an easy transition, that one. Um, but in saying that, once I finished my degree, I hit rock bottom. I went through depression for a good 12 months and it's quite a common thing for Olympians or, you know, your lead athletes, even just people in life, even going through a big experience like a wedding or, you know, when there's a big lead up to something and a focus and you just sacrifice so much for that one thing, when it's done, um, if you don't have something to replace it in terms of a focus or a passion and and the identity, like you said earlier, attached to that, it, it it's a real tough um transition i found it really tough about 80 percent of olympians go through post-olympic depression you just don't hear about it because obviously all the focus is about the olympics yeah um so yeah it was a really tough gig for me i found it uh, i went through some of my toughest darkest days um during that transition And so what did you do to help yourself um, get out of that? Because one thing that, you know, and it's getting back to that visualisation and the advice that Peter Brock gave you, it was all about, Mm. you know, the theme of not playing the victim, okay, okay, accepting what's happened and and how you can go about moving forward. So, you know, how did you get through those those dark days to move forward? Because, I mean, everyone in our life does go through times of hard Hard, you know that's life it's good and bad yeah. so yeah how did, Most you, definitely. did you pull yourself through? I actually I ended up going over to Spain for six months and then I babysat in exchange for a room oh holiday <laughs> I overseas that holiday might, I thought, <laughs> that's one way to do it that might be a good thing just go try <laughs> just go and experience a totally different lifestyle and the biggest thing I learned from that was siestas I love their lifestyle. Of, so sleeping you know, and holidaying. And eating great food. Yeah, I was like, yeah. no. But I did know. I got to a point where I was like, I can't keep doing this. Like, what the hell am I doing with my life? I've got to sort my stuff out. So I came back home and, and that's when it really kicked in too in terms of well, what the hell am I doing next with my life. Um, the, one of the, I actually read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And um, I really – the biggest thing is having a focus – I think that's the real key. You've got to have a vision, got to have a focus. If you don't have that, of course, you just get lost and you react every day to different things. So I really had to come back to what do I really want? What do I um, and why do I really want that? You know, and one of my things I became very clear about is that I wanted a property. I wanted to create wealth for myself. I'm sick of being a, a poor athlete living week by week and I really wanted to create property I wanted to I knew I wanted to work for myself Um, I wanted to have that flexibility I knew I was a hard worker and I could focus and be disciplined obviously through my sporting background Um, I really wanted to um, create yeah just have my own business and have that flexibility take siestas if I wanted to I think there's a lot of power in having a quick 20 minute nap for productivity during the day also I'm going to tell my husband that because he doesn't understand why I'm having my naps in the day (laughs) instead of trying to keep drinking more coffee which you know which a lot of us are common to but um yeah so anyway so yeah that's where I got really focused and um decided I wanted to buy a property I ended up working three jobs I lived at home with mum because that's what Robert Kiyosaki did live at home as long as you can save up your money so you know I came back at what 24 25 um and friends and that had you know got good jobs buying houses and here I am with no money and back living home with mum and um I ended up finding a job that had a company car so that's how I was able to get around and I had three jobs seven days a week and just worked my butt off for a year and then bought my first property 3k's outside of the city Brisbane city and um yeah that's how it kind of all that's how I got myself back on track I just had to get focused again on something that I really wanted and um work towards it yeah it's really interesting because um you know focus has definitely already been a reoccurring theme in this conversation but what I found really interesting there was that you actually took time out to go, okay, actually ask yourself, what do you want? And I don't think Mm. that we just, you know, we get up, we go to work, we, you know, just go through the process of our lives, but we don't actually take time and go, actually, what kind of life do I want? You know, we just, we end up, you know, married or separated with the kids or, you know, on our own or whatever. Um, And we just think, oh, this is just, you know, life. But actually saying, Mm. no, no, hang on, hold, hold the horses actually really what do I want in my life and then actually putting a plan in a focus to go to that so I think actually stopping and asking that question um, is just so critical because we tend Mm -hmm. to not 
do it and just keep going. And and people say, when am I going to get off this train? Well, how do you get off it if you don't know what stop you want to get off it or what your destination is? So I think that's so critical. Yeah, it is. And I think people too, I found myself too through my journey of being an entrepreneur is I was I was figuring out what businesses were going to make a lot of money versus figuring out what lifestyle do I want and figuring out what that lifestyle looks like and then creating a business that's going to suit that lifestyle. A lot of it, I had to do a lot of self-development. I had to learn a lot about myself. I did um, a personality profiling, which was great. I really, that was a big pinnacle in my life too, learning about, oh, there's actually four different personality types and now I know why I'm like I am, you know, why I get along with these people, don't get along with these people, why I have these certain values and um, just personality types that were actually there from childhood and I need to really mould my strengths um, around, you know, in terms of when I'm thinking about a lifestyle and what business career is going to best suit that or what um, niche I'm going to get into. It's really got to suit my strengths and match the lifestyle that I want. So you really have to think outside the box as well. Um, it's not you, I had to get out of society norms and break away from that. Mum would say, you know, just just go get a bloody job, nine to five and pay your bills and you know, that's how they raise, right, security. And yeah. I was like, no, I don't want that. I don't want that lifestyle. I, you know, I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> and I think so, one of, a lot of our listeners, I think, do fall into this trap where, you know, they, they think, oh, I'll just get a trade and they become apprentice and they get qualified. Then they go into business themselves and, and then they're just working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week and they're not making – you know, any real money and they, they go into business to have this lifestyle and have choice and freedom and it actually is the opposite impact that they, they you know, have it so hard to take themselves out of the business or put in systems to help them um, be able to, you know, run it without them. They just get stuck in the business and I think that's so critical that, you know, as small business owners, we really need to look at not what not is just what going to make us money, but also the kind of life that we want and matching that to the personality stuff, which I agree entirely because I did a personality thing um, about 18 months ago and that really changed what kind of work I did and where I went. So I agree entirely with that. But like you've said, you know, you really need to understand what you want out of your life and then design your business and other things around that. And I think a lot of our particular listeners in the trade industry tend to not do that. Mm, yeah, very good point. Yeah, and it's not easy. Like it doesn't just happen overnight either. It's taken me a good 10 years to get to obviously where I am now and be really feel like it's the, the right fit for me and, you know, using all that years of experience and stepping stones to in order to to get to this point so it's um it's a journey a lot of the time too sometimes you don't people say you've got to get clarity and I used to get so frustrated with that because it's like I don't know like I haven't tried it yet so I'm not sure if I like it or not or you know and sometimes the best thing I find for clarity is just to do it just to try stuff and you'll figure as in the process of doing you'll get clarity Mm. so Sometimes when people say, oh, you've got to get clear, you've got really clear clear on your vision and get really clear, sit down and write it out and map it out. And sometimes that can be really frustrating for people because sometimes you're just like, well, I've kind of got an interest in this, this or this, or I'm thinking about this or that. And sometimes you just got to go give it a shot. And then through the process of doing, you'll figure out the clarity and you'll get clear on no or yes of whether that's something you want to do or not. I had a great conversation with someone years ago about the concept of thinking outside the box, and mm. uh, we we kind of reached the conclusion that how the hell can you think outside the box when you're in the damn box? You can't see outside <laughs> the box, so you know you've got to either climb out of the box and see what's out there before you can start thinking about what's outside the box. It's kind of the same thing. Um, Yay, so, Selena! I've got a question about all those principles. You know, you've you've um, played at the Olympics, like reached the pinnacle of sport, uh, done a scholarship. You know, like you've done some pretty amazing stuff, and obviously applied a lot of those principles. Do you ever get tired of of being that disciplined? You know, like because it takes work every day, doesn't it, to to it, follow those principles? Does that get tiring? It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I, I. I don't know. I'm just. I, I think anyone can be disciplined. You know, it's just habits it's um you know when you really want something you will figure out how to get it if you want it that badly um 
I know for me, I put a lot of words and pictures and quotes on my wall to remind me every day because I think it's very easy to forget. Like we can sit down and take the time out to go, right, what do I really want? Why do I really want this? And what would make me really happy? And, mm. you know, you put it on the wall and you go, oh, my God, how the hell am I going to get that? But you've got to keep putting it out there. Like uh, one of the most powerful things actually I learned from Natalie Cook, if you, I don't know if many people um, know her story, but you've probably all heard of the name. She yep. won the gold medal at the 2000 Olympics for beach volleyball. And one of the things that she did two years prior to winning that gold medal is that one of her mentors that they got on at the time, Kurik Ashley, he said to them, right, what do you want? Well, I want a gold medal at the 2000 Olympics in two years' time. This is what we want. Okay, you've got to start acting, talking, like you are a gold medalist right now, like you've already won, you've already run the gold medal. So how are you going to act? How are you going to talk? What does it look like? What does it feel like? You've won it. So they used to have to go around and actually introduce themselves <laughs> as, hi, I'm Nellie Cook. I'm the Olympic gold medalist from the 2000 Olympics in beach volleyball. And they'd be like, what? It's like 1988. You're like, it's not, two, you know, you know. They're like, yeah, I've won the gold medal. This is who I am. I'm the gold medalist. And not only that, but they actually... Everything in Nat's house, she turned to gold. So she got a gold toaster, gold watch, <laughs> gold satin bed sheets, um, gold toothbrush, the Colgate, you know, the gold palm of soap. Um, anything that she could make gold in her house, she made gold. So every morning when you get out of bed and you're like, oh, what am I doing? We all go through it. Why am I doing this? Am I doing the right thing? Oh, mm. I just, I don't, I feel like quitting. I don't think I can do this anymore, you know. You're constantly reminded of your vision and what you're getting out of bed for every morning. So, you know, it worked for her, obviously, with that Olympics, um, and it is. It's a very powerful. So I'm a big believer in goal setting is that I'm not – I actually don't believe in goal setting anymore because we don't have control of time and we don't have control of certain circumstances and events that happen to us. For example, I lost my house in the floods in the 2011, as I mentioned earlier. I had goals – that got totally, excuse the pun, blown out of the water of being able to achieve those goals because of a friggin' major life-changing event. So I'm very big on intention crafting. Craft your intention. We don't have control of time. We don't have control of certain events. But you've got to get really focused on what what do I want? Craft your intention. What is, you know, you can still paint the picture and know what it looks like and, um I'm a big believer in the discipline of yeah you've got to put you've got to put your um, to do list together you know I really like that book the one thing so you can figure out what's the one thing I want in five years what's the one thing I want in one year what's the one thing I want in six months what's the one thing I want this week what's the one thing I want to do today I do and love that book as back, well <laughs> Warren yeah, just rolled just his come, eyes because I always write uh, about that book <laughs> oh, somebody else is going to beat me over the head with this book <laughs> yeah. It's such, I think it's just when I come back to the Olympics, this is one of the thing, messages I used to share. I used to do seminars after the Olympics about the Olympian mindset and how you apply that to business owners. One of the biggest things was you just got to get focused in the now. Like you can't change yesterday. You can't, you know, predict what's going to come tomorrow or even an hour. But if you can just focus on that one thing that you've got to do right now um, and writing that on, I've got a great whiteboard on my wall that I've write down the one thing that I want to achieve today and I know what I'm trying to achieve in a week and a month, etc. It just simplicity is important and not to get overwhelmed. Um, so one of the things I talked about at the Olympic Games, going through the Olympics leading up to the Olympics, is we used to train eight hours a day, six to eight hours a day. And we'd do two court sessions and then in the afternoon go and lift weights. And some of those weight sessions you'd get to and you'd be like, oh, God, I'm so tired. My legs are so sore from all that jumping I've just done in training. How am I meant to go and squat right now? But if you start thinking like that, you're already defeated. So you actually just have to go, right, first squat, put the weights on. Right, I'm just going to focus on the first rep. So in order to do the first rep, I've just got to go down slowly, hold at the bottom, and up fast. Okay, that's one. I got through one. Great. Now I'm going to do that again. Go down, hold up and then two. So we, I came down to focusing on um, rep by rep, not focusing on the 45 gym session or even the fact that I've got three 
sets to do of squats, I actually came down to let's just focus on the first rep. And what do I have to do in order to get that first rep done? Oh. So you can apply that to life. You can apply that back to business. Just Absolutely. breaking it back down to the now and the, what what has to be done now and just focus in on that and block everything else out. It's it's something, Selena, that I'm sure is part of, uh, you know, and I'm probably stealing your thunder here, with business owners, and I find this with our tradies, that when they think about where it is they want to be or what they want the business to look like or what they want their revenue or profits to be, that seems so insurmountable and there's so many things to do to get there that, uh, and I get the same thing, of almost being paralyzed by holy crap, where do I start? Like, which one thing do I pick? Because there's 157,000 things. Mm. Uh, which one of them do I choose? How do you choose uh, or, or how do you prioritize some of that stuff, Selena? Yeah, I guess it, um, it's probably going to be very individual to different scenarios. But I, for me, I find just breaking it down to what's, you know, if you know what the end result is you're trying to get, whether it's a financial goal or a lifestyle, you, um, figuring out, sometimes you don't know how that's going to happen, but you might just know something that you can get done now or you may have to do, I like sometimes get a piece of paper for each scenario, put a line down the middle and look at the pros and cons of each different situation. And just by dumping stuff out of my head onto a piece of paper, that can get very clear for me on what should be my priority right now, which scenario I should go after. Yeah, Um, because I know with like my personality type, I'm all how-to, you know, and mm. I'm sure a lot of our our trades would be as well. Um, But I just get crippled by, well, how am I going to do that? And that's what I get caught up in, you know, and I just love that how you were saying about the intention craving rather than the the goal thing because I know Warwick's big on he doesn't, believe in goal setting either no. he's an intention enthusiast as well <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah it's just really interesting about you know trying not to get focused on that how to aspect yeah if just get clear on what you want why you want it and right because I, I this just happened to me just literally last week I was like right I've got these um, sporting academies that I'm doing at the moment and we're pretty heavily involved with one that's about to launch and I just like, man, I love this and I want to do this for more sports. But it's just there is so much time with video editing and video production. Like it's I have to get a, a person involved with each project to be able to manage more than just one. Like that's just I don't know how. I'm like, okay, I've tried to get uni students involved and this and that and whatever. And then, bang, I've got a mate who knows a video guy and he's done a video for me and then he's like, oh, my God, I can see the vision of what you're trying to do. Can I look after all your video production and editing and let's get this rolled out? I've got this person I want to introduce you to and this person and this person for this sport and that sport. And there's about seven different sports we could start next year. And it's such a huge relief because if he looks after all the video editing and production, Bob's your uncle and off we go because that just saves me about 70% of the time in my business. Mm. So I put it out there. And bang, it's turned up. So sometimes just thinking about it and just going, right, well, how can I? How can I? Not like, shit, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? It's like, yeah, well, ha- just put it out there. How how can I do this? Think outside the box. Well, what if I did this? Nah, maybe this, I don't know. Then all of a sudden you might get a phone call or a person you meet or it's amazing when you just put that focus and energy into what you start attracting. So um, I know that can stuff can sound a bit fluffy, but it really does work if you really put your mind to, well, this is what I need to make this happen. And if it's meant to happen, it'll it'll start to figure itself out. I really believe in that. Sometimes it's maybe if it's getting all too hard and things aren't working, you really got to take some time out and go, well, is this what I'm meant to be doing? Maybe there's something else I'm meant to be focusing in on. And you know what Peter Brock said? Who who could argue with the great Brocky? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, Selena, you mentioned you lost your house. Uh, when you say you lost your house in the floods, like, and I've seen photos, but for the benefit of our listeners, <laughs> um, can you just describe what happened to your house? 
Yeah, well, we were in Rockley, which people probably know Rockley if you're in Brisbane. It's one of the low-lying places. But, um, yeah, two-story house, and it came up to the ceiling. On so, the second story. so Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Like neighbours oh, are nice. in one set and that went over their roof. And, yeah, so I'm sure people who were in Brisbane for that know that it was such a huge time for mm. just for the community, just an amazing time for community. Yep. A lot of good stuff came out of it, even though there was a lot of devastation and, you know, you lose everything and you lose what of you know, worked so hard to save money, buy a house and buy all the furniture and match this and all that and then all of a sudden in an instant it's totally gone. Everything, photos, your whole life. And I guess it, footpath. I guess it also puts into priority what is important in life. I mean, you know, the hours you spent matching the colours with the curtains and the, the the nice furniture and all that really doesn't matter in the end, does it? You know, it's yeah, really definitely about, it's nice. But yeah. when when push comes to shove and there's you know, at the end of the day, we've all got one thing in common and that's we're going to die when it comes down to the basics of it. And this is how I used to get through some of my Spoiler trainings. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds very, very, um, you know, deep and dark. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, we don't know when that day is going to be. You know, we all hope we live to a healthy, ripe age. But for a lot of people, we, you know, there's things that happen in life and we don't. And it really just gets back to, the yeah, the the... Um, just making the most of each day and not being afraid to give things a go. And, you know, I used to, when I used to go through training, there were so many times I wanted to quit and I just had that vision of the opening ceremony and being in the Olympian for the rest of my life that that's what kept me going. That's what kept me there. And um, it just, yeah, sometimes when you do break it down, what's the worst thing can happen? Die? Well, if I'm not going to die, then just give it a go. Like, really, people are worried about what other people are going to say or, um you know, one thing in life, you can always make more money, but you can't get time back. So um, definitely making the most of each day is important, my, in one of my philosophies anyway. Mm. It's it's a tough one to keep front of mind, I think. It uh, is. You know, I know. We get caught just, up in life. Yeah, even speaking for myself, you know, rushing around, appointments, running multiple businesses, it's so easy to forget uh, about being grateful and, and focusing on what I do have, uh, but also on that moment-to-moment -moment thing of making each moment count. And whether that's doing an invoice for a client or uh, working on some marketing or spending time with your kids, whatever it is, it's it's about putting 100% into each of those things in that moment. And that's where um, multitasking is, has been shown to be counterproductive and uh you know not good for us because we're not actually giving full attention to each moment yeah and i've become very big on that is um like you just mentioned before gratitude to i go for a walk now every morning and just take the time to give gratitude mm. during that moment because it's so easy like i said you can get so caught up during the day that you forget but through that process now it's really i do it a lot now during the day without even you know um without having to think, oh, I've got to, I should be giving gratitude. I just do it naturally now, which has made a really big difference too in terms of just being present in the moment a lot mm. more, um, enjoying life a lot more. Yep. Um, it becomes a habit, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And it's a good feeling. When you feel good, you get more good things too. So it's, um, it, it's something I, I didn't do and it's been a big lesson for me. So, Selena, you shared uh, a whole lot of stuff in today's episode. I think we've covered just about a thousand <laughs> self-help books in this episode alone. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, one question that we like to ask all of our guests on the show, and uh, I can't wait to hear the answer to this one from you, but <laughs> if you had a thousand tradies in a room, what's one piece of advice you would love to leave them with? One piece of advice for a thousand tradies. Keep dreaming, keep believing, keep getting out there and designing the life that you want and don't be afraid to, to give things a go. Mm. If you're not happy, stop and change it. Mm. It's not easy, but, uh, you know, life's too short. Great. Well so um, thank you again, Selena. Now, I know you're involved in a number of different projects, but if uh, our listeners want to go and find out more about you as a person and perhaps uh, check out some of the business uh, things that you're up to these days, what would be the best way to do that? 
Yeah, probably one of the biggest things if um, with any listeners out there, if you want to hand with your website, I have a website agency. So um, scoblewebsites.com is probably the easiest way on Facebook as well. Um, yeah, that's probably the – I've got my selenascoble.com website, which obviously is just information about me and some motivational tips and stories. Um, so, yeah, either one of those. Cool. Excellent. All right, well – Selena, thanks again. That's been a great chat. Uh, I know our listeners will get a ton out of that, and it's good that you've been saying it and not Michaela and I uh, banging on about all this stuff again. So um, thank you again for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you so much, guys, and thank you to everyone who's listened to the end. Appreciate their tuning in. <laughs> That's a great point. Everybody listens to the end of our podcast. <laughs> thanks, Selena. So thanks again to Selena Scoble. Uh, she's got a whole lot of things going on. She's involved with uh, Indigenous sporting programs in Australia as well. Uh, you'll probably find that when you go and check out her own website, selenascoble.com. Um, she does websites. She's very passionate about digital marketing. And, uh, yeah, one of the things about websites is that the Tradies Business Show has a new one. Woo-hoo. So we've got a fancy new website um, and there's a free download thingamajig on there. So if you're looking for tips to market your trade business, website would be one of them, but there's a number of things you can do on your website uh, that are easy and, and fairly cheap. Go to tradiesbusinessshow.com, grab the uh, 99 marketing tips for tradies. So just stick your name and email address in there and we'll pop it in your inbox and uh, run through the list and see how many you can implement. I mean, Selena talked today about just getting it done, just doing it and um, try some of those things. And just because it's 99, don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to do them all. No. And they're not going to suit all your business, but let's say pick two that yep. you can uh, – just pick two. They could be tiny ones, but just take some action. Yep. And cool. take action by going and getting it yeah. to start with. So go to tradiesbusinessshow.com, grab the 99 marketing tips, and give us some feedback too on the uh, Facebook page or leave a voicemail. Tell us uh, if you've implemented one and uh, how did it work for you. So uh, thanks for tuning in. And until next episode, bye. Uru. You've been listening to the Tradies Business Show with Warwick Bidwell and Michaela Clark. Want to get off the tools into true business ownership? Find out how at tradiesbusinessshow.com.